as they come down, uh, trying to find how to switch gears here. <laughs> Hallelujah. I always tell uh, my story about my golden retriever named Dauber. Um, I tell you this all the time, but he was such a such an obedient dog, amen, that even when I took him off of the, we put him out on the clothesline, we had a clothesline with a little pulley on it, you know, so he could run back and forth across the yard, and he would never buck against the cable or the chain, so I would walk out there to undo him, and uh, when I undid him, you know, and just, if, especially if I did it secretly and kind of unsnapped him and set his cable or his chain or whatever he was tied to down, <laughs> And I would walk off, and he just sat there with the saddest little face because he didn't know he was free. Amen. Yeah, let that sink in for a minute. Hallelujah. He would sit there on his little haunches and look at me with a sad face like I thought you was going to turn me loose because he was so obedient to the, to the, to the cable that he was tied to. If, if, he, if he thought that weight was still there, or he didn't know, like I said, that he was free. He just sat there. And I'd walk halfway across the, across the yard and look back at him. He'd be sitting there looking at me. Amen. Just like some of you this morning sat here looking with a little sad face because you don't know that you're free. Amen. You may have heard about it. You may have been free at one time and you're not now. Amen. Let's get free. And I'd turn around and I was like, Dauber, come here. He's in heaven now. So, we, you know, he was such a, he was a, he was born again, no doubt. Amen. <laughs> I can't prove that biblically, but I just know it in my spirit. Amen. But he would look at me, and, and I'd get halfway across the yard, and I'd say, come here. And he would still, just like we do, I, you would watch him stand up and begin to inch out <laughs> to where when all of a sudden, hey, man, we need some all of a sudden in the body of Christ. When all of a sudden, he was like, wait a minute, I'm out further then my tether generally allows me to go. And soon as he realized that, he was off to the races. <laughs> he would run and he would jump and he would, uh, uh, Kristen left, if she could attest, or, or the, well, Owen's here, he could attest. He would run wide open and jump as far as he could jump out into our pond, just free. Amen? That's the way he wants us to be, the father that is. Amen? Does that mean we come and we run around this place every time. Well, if we're singing How Great Thou Art in a worship setting, you know, and we're, there's, a, there's an atmosphere of honor in the place and respect, and, and you're running and shouting, you might be out of order. Amen. But when the Spirit of God's moving this way, and we're singing uh, free to run, free to dance, free to live for you, amen. And, and you know, you're not a bunch of spiritual duds, are you? You can sense that the atmosphere had a different charge in it this morning, can't you? If you can't stay around, you'll get it. Amen. You can sense that. Praise God. And when you yield to that, first time I yielded to dancing, I mean, I shook all kinds of stuff off of me. I haven't cried about being disobedient since. <laughs> you say, what's that mean, Pastor? I used to go home and cry to Kristen tears because I was like, I felt like the Lord was telling me and leading me to do something. I didn't do it. And I'd cry. Tears of disobedience. <laughs> and she'd pat me, and the Lord had encouraged me. But, you know, finally sitting there about where Nile, I believe, or Anthony is there, sitting there, and I stepped out in that aisle because the, the, the service was flowing that way, and it come on me. It, how did it come on you, Lathan? And just in my, in, down on the inside, it's like, seems like it'd be good to dance, you know. <laughs> and uh, I was like, I, I tell you all the time, I'll get to my sermon here in a minute. Everybody all right? Did you eat plenty of breakfast this morning so you can hang in here with me? But uh, trying to switch gears, I guess, is what I'm trying to do. But uh, <clears throat> I said, Lord, what will I do? You know, I was trying to come up with a dance that would be appropriate for church. You know, we, certain ones wouldn't be, right? <laughs> and I was like, you know, what is the Charleston, you know, is that okay? Or, I don't really know what the Charleston is, but I think it is a dance. You know, the twist. I won an award one time at a dance for the best twist. Yeah. At my prom, they had the twist competition. So I was like, I told Kristen, I said, get out of the way, because here I come. 
<laughs> and I got the t-shirt, man. I wore it for several years. They gave me a t-shirt for winning that contest. Amen. I was like, so what do I do? And he's like, just trust me and get in the aisle. I felt like I had to get in the aisle. And I got in the aisle, and I mean the Holy Ghost come on me. He come on me. You know he's in us. I've been teaching you that he's in you. You know that? He's never not going to be if you're born again. He's in you. But he still comes upon us. Amen? And I don't want you to get pigeonholed in your thinking. He's within us. He always will be. But we should expect him to come on us. And many times obedience causes him to come on you. Amen? Elijah, when he girded up his loins and began to run, he took the first step, didn't he? He said, I'm tying this baby up. I'm tying this robe and this tunic or whatever he was wearing up. I'm getting it out of the way so these legs can move. Because the Holy Ghost told me to run ahead of the king. Hallelujah. So obedience causes the Spirit of God to come on you. Amen? And I'm telling you, my obedience, because I felt like I was supposed to step out in that aisle, was that was, that was my obedience to step out in that aisle. And I mean, I'd, there's wonder there's carpet there to this day, because I danced it, man. I danced it. I don't know what it looked like, because I got in the Spirit. He was totally, when, when you got the Spirit within and the Spirit upon, you're immersed. <laughs> it's good. Too many believers haven't been immersed. Yeah, they've been dipped in water, but I'm talking about Holy Ghost dip. Amen? And when he come upon me in that form, I danced with all my might. I sat down, my physical body, because of the anointing and probably the the... I don't know how to say it other than violent dancing. <laughs> I was trying to give King David a run for his money. Saying I'll become even more undignified than this. Then, then uh, I was exhausted. I remember sitting down, drunk in the spirit. Amen. You know the Bible's, you know Ephesians. The church started with a bunch of drunk in the spirit people. A bunch of immersed in the spirit people. Amen. Too many too many of us today are thinking, you know, that's offensive or, or we got to watch that because we're, you know, we don't want to run people off. Well, I'm here to tell you that's how church started. Amen. And, and he added 3,000 to them that day. Hallelujah. I, I've never, I'm yet to preach a message where 3,000 were added. I'm looking forward to it. Might as well dream, right? But it would appear that it came on the cusp or on the hindquarter of a drunk in the immersed in the spirit experience. That's how we got going, church. Your grassroots goes back to being drunk in the Holy Ghost. Ephesians tells us, right? Be not drunk with wine, but be filled or be overflowing or be drunk in the spirit. Amen. So anyway, I danced it off. <laughs> And I've thought about that since. I thought, you know, I've never went home after a service and cried because of my disobedience. Have I maybe been disobedient? Sure, probably somewhere, but not very often because I danced that off. I'm convinced that my obedience to step out there and cut a rug, so to speak, it, it shook that off of me. Amen. And and I mean, if you can look like that in, in front of all your peers and the people that you, you esteem highly and, and all that stuff, you'll be all right. Amen. And I always, I end that story with this, Miss Eileen, uh, you know, she was, she was probably in her late 80s, early 90s at that time. And, and Pastor Bill listened to her. I paid attention when he, when he, he would tell us stories like once a week he went to set with her because she knew things in prayer. Because she's better than us? No, because she served the Lord longer than us. Amen. The anointing increases if you so choose with your age. Amen. Where's that teaching? The anointing will increase the longer you're living if you'll choose to be obedient and go with him. That's why he wants us to live long in the earth. He needs some 90-year anointings in the earth, right? It's pretty obvious, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not tooting my horn, but there's a little more anointing in my preaching than there was 12 years ago. 
Praise God. And the longer you live on this planet Earth, if you choose to walk with him and be obedient, the anointing should increase. So she had a 90-plus anointing. Amen. She prayed that stuff out. She knew things. She would come up here and begin to pray. He would call her up every once in a while. I mean, there's, I'm looking at people. There's just a handful of us that know this, right? Because there's so many new people here that didn't get to watch her function in the spirit. When she'd walk up here and she'd begin to pray. And, oh, I, ooh, ee, I, I see it. She'd say, I see it. And we were like, tell us what you see. And she'd get so in the spirit. But she, she prayed things out satisfied, prayed things in, prayed things out in this place right in front of us and in her personal prayer time that we're probably still still trying to grasp hold of in the spirit. So Pastor Bill sat with her a lot, uh, and anyway, she come up to me after that dance, and she had never spoke to me personally. I mean, she was a tenderly kind person, don't get me wrong. She'd say hello, and but for me to sit down and have a conversation with her, I, it had never happened. But she come walking across the front straight to me. You know, you can tell when someone's coming to you. I was like, she coming to me. I was like, all right, Nathan, here it comes. <laughs> Heavenly word from God, from, from, the, from the anointed one. Amen. <laughs> the prayer warrior, the hallelujah. And she walked up to me, and I thought, she's getting ready to speak. So I turned on my receptors to receive. And she said, that was really something. And turned around and walked off. <laughs> praise the lord it was something amen it was something that caused me to learn how to be more obedient amen go with me in your bibles to ephesians chapter 4 hallelujah seems like a good place to transition <laughs> that rejoicing anointing you can stay there but i want to get this across to you so we got to switch gears Hallelujah. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's truth. We thank you that it changes our lives. It's already changed our lives, but this morning it will even more deeply impact us and change our lives this morning. <clears throat> Dealing with ways of thinking and mindsets this morning. Because the washing of the word renews the mind. So we thank you for your precious holy written word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. In Ephesians chapter 4, down there around verse 11, it says, He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers <clears throat> for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Hallelujah. He's talking about perfect people. Nobody's perfect. Ain't that what we heard all of our life? Yes. We understand that. But why do we magnify that so much? Why do... Why does the human nature want to magnify always the negative side of something? When the word of God is always pulling on the positive, the born again side of you, the spirit filled side of you. Amen. So when we come here this morning, I, I heard myself say this last week about the sponge. You remember, uh, I, I don't want you to get the idea that you shouldn't come here and be spongy. You should come and you should listen and you should soak up the worship and the praise time and you should soak up the word time, praise the Lord, but it must become a rooted, uh, 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 deposited forever thing in you and then it'll begin to come out. Amen. It's got to get in to get out, right? You got to get born again to, to, to walk in these things. You got to get filled with the spirit and yes, the spirit comes and fills you. So it's kind of an outside-in type thing. But once we get to this place, we live from the inside out. And we're constantly being added to and perfected. He told us here in Ephesians, he says that, that these ministers were put in place for the building up, the edifying, the perfecting. Amen. The perfecting of the saints. So we come here this morning with the mindset, I'm going this morning to be perfected. I'm going to church this morning. I'm not going to forsake the assembling, just like the word says, to be edified. 
The word edified is to be built up. One form of that word is to be charged. Like a battery gets charged. Amen. So we come together as a body of believers to be built up and to be charged up. Hallelujah. Amen. We stay plugged into the source to keep the battery topped off, but you will never replace this corporate setting. So I'm saying all that to tell you what I was saying last week. I don't want you to get a mindset that, well, you know, I got to live everything from the inside out, and, and that's true, but it's vitally important to sit in the assembly. Amen? Because the Bible tells us out of our belly flows what? Rivers of living water. This is one of the greatest analogies to understand the corporate anointing. Because when Nancy comes and she gives of her river, you know, what do you want to name it? Skillet Fork or Nancy's River or whatever? And it'd be a good river. But then Greg comes and he gives of his river. Leo and Winnie come and give of their river. And we begin to let those rivers flow, and the Holy Ghost is like the funnel, and he funnels them all down, and all of a sudden, you've got a mighty force taking place. Amen? Can you see that? If the skillet fork moves X amount cubic feet of water in a day, and I'm the skillet, when Adam comes and he gives, all of a sudden, we're doubled in that, right? The corporate anointing ramps up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you, you have a service like we have. It'll help the preacher immensely. Amen. It'll help him uh, step over into a place where he's getting that anointing, that teaching that goes into you. And if you'll stay receptive and pulling on that, all of a sudden it'll get stuck to your spirit. Hallelujah. When you got your mindset right, the word of God and the things of God sticky. I want it to be stuck in you. That's why the, uh, David said, I hide it. I keep it in my heart. The word he gave me a couple years ago in our prayer, to get it embedded. Embedded. You know, have you ever had a splinter embedded? It don't just come out with ease. And we don't want the word just to come out of us or be stole from us. Just like the parable that Jesus said, this is the greatest of all parables. The sower sows the word and immediately the enemy comes to take the word. But when the word's embedded, when it's in good ground, it's deep, it's not laying on the surface, it don't get snatched away. Amen. It takes some time sometimes for the things that's been deposited within you to begin to grow and, and show. Hallelujah. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. There was times I thought that's the worst preaching I've ever heard. And who was I talking about? I was talking about me. <laughs> I've listened to myself and I thought that's horrible. Praise the Lord. Help me, Jesus. But all of a sudden, through time and years and much planning, amen, things beginning to grow. And I'm not saying I'm good now by any means, but praise the Lord. I see fruit. Not just in my preaching, in my life. The things that they, they uh, endeavored through the word of God, Pastor Bill and Vicki, and, and my mother and my father, and Pastor Andy and Brenda, and my uncle Wilford. I've been surrounded by good people all my life. I'm beginning to see some of those things come to the surface. Amen. So don't be discouraged. If you keep yourself in the assembly, if you keep yourself with a mindset of being obedient, things will come to the surface. Amen? So for the perfecting, for the edifying, for the building up of the body, amen. Well, why'd you tell us all that? Because we're still talking about authority and power. We know that Luke, I've already been a while, so we're just going to fan through some of these. Last week we talked about Luke 10 when it says that Jesus, he looked at him and said, I've given you power over what? All the power of the enemy. I've given you authority I've given you dominion. I've given you power over everything the enemy has, and he sent them out, right? He anointed them with power, praise the Lord, and authority. And then uh, he made that even sweeter when he was resurrected, and he looked at his followers and said, All power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Amen. Arians here. This is exciting news. <laughs> All power has been given unto me. He said, now you go in my name. And we would understand when you are going in someone else's name, you're going in underneath their authority, their power. So he's endued us. 
Hallelujah. The authority vested within the church. Amen. Hallelujah. To go into the world and stand in a place that they came back, remember, and said, even devils. Remember that? Even devils are subject to us when we use your name. And I always say he tells them not to be all excited about that because, I mean, Jesus saw it like this. That's no big deal. But we've turned it into it's a big deal. The devil's big. And, and yes, there is some power he has in the earth. And there is some places of dominion that he holds in the earth. But praise God, when I was washed in the blood, it said he took me up out of the earth system. Amen. And hooked me up to his system and sent me back as an ambassador hallelujah, into another system with the operation of his system. Amen. Said I could speak, hallelujah. I could, I could uh, uh, preach and pray and prophesy. I could speak and cast out devils. That's what the word tells us. Amen. And this is where, this is where uh, I want you to go to Ephesians, or no, 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I used to have a, well, I still have a friend. <laughs> that used to say that, uh, Lathan, I got what it takes to be the best. I just told Brent this this week. We were in the gym, and, and I was working out with this friend one time. <laughs> he had an amazing way of, of pulling out these funny little quips, you know, and he was underneath his, his bar getting all worked up and ready to lift this tremendous weight and I was going to spot him and he looked at me and said Lathan I've got what it takes to be the best <laughs> and I said it, it tickled me so much I said just hold on because now I can't spot you because he did it so serious <laughs> amen and I said let's regroup here I said what makes you think you've got what it takes to be the best he said I just know I do did I tell you second Corinthians chapter 4 he said, I just do. I want you to know, I, I went away from that, and I was talking to the Lord one day, and that phrase come back to me. He said, Lathan, I put within you what it takes to be the best. It was just a funny little thing. He said, it was Nicholas Tucker. Anthony will appreciate that. He said, I got what it takes to be the best. I said, I have no doubt you do. But the Holy Ghost brought that back to me. That we have what it takes to be the best, praise the Lord. And that's not to be haughty, and that's not to be high-minded. That's to, that's to say that we are to rule and reign in the earth. Now, the Bible tells us not to be ignorant of what? The devil's devices. And as I, as I prayed this week, I, I, I see devices. Hey Amen. I'm trying to decide if this is what I want to do. <laughs> Can you tell? Sure, that one's not where I want to be because that's 1 Corinthians. 4.16, let's look at that. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Aren't you glad? For our light afflictions, for our light afflictions, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I want to go back one verse because there's this, I already kind of addressed it, there's this kind of, I, I believe with all my heart, it's, it's been impregnated or I shouldn't say that word maybe but deposited tried to be deposited within the church of this attitude of everybody focused probably uh, maybe not this group praise the Lord but most people when they read that scripture they automatically focused in on our afflictions didn't they oh my Lord our afflictions he said it right there we're going to be afflicted right have you been around have you lived any have you been in the earth and you talk to other believers and, and when they get to that and they see that afflictions for our afflictions, oh, here it comes, afflictions. Right? But he said they're, they're nothing. We don't focus 
on the standpoint or the, the part of those afflictions temporal and nothing. And the, <laughs> the breakdown of the English language when you look up that word afflictions, because automatically half the body is going to say, well, I'm going to be sick because of my afflictions. And, and I'm not saying it's totally not that, that the enemy comes against us, sure, with, with illnesses and diseases, yeah. And we got to stand our ground and stand authority against those. But really the root of this word afflictions is the, the things of persecutions and stuff like that coming through other people against them. Yeah, it'll change your outlook because if, I always said if you've never told nobody about Jesus or if you've never been persecuted, let me back up, if you've never had somebody get upset, you've never told nobody about Jesus, right? Because if you go around about a believer that says Jesus is the doorway to heaven, somebody will get upset. And the truth is that somebody is not the one that's upset. It's the devil behind that. They're instigating spirits, familiar spirits, seducing spirits that are in the atmosphere around us that are influencing people. Doesn't make that person a bad person, but says these light afflictions. I do my due diligence, I go to the Greek, and I go to the Hebrew, and I look those words up, and they're not one of the, not in the Greek in this form of the word afflictions was one sickness or disease tied to it. It was referring to persecutions and people coming against the church. And he said they're temporal because nothing the devil's got can last. Just look what he does to the human body, Right? I mean, if, if he totally gets a person into his system, most of those people don't live past 45, right? Arian's here this morning. Because we let, reread last week, John 10, 10, what's it say? Steal, kill, and destroy. He has no other purpose but to steal, kill, and destroy. So they're, they're instigating and they're, they're doing all these things. I mean, those people are possessed of a devil. That's not what I'm saying. But he operates in that soulish realm, your mind, your will, and your emotions. And we have to pull away from this negative way of thinking that I'm always focused on the afflictions. I'm always, I mean, I, I've said it with the scripture, you know, that says, be of good cheer. Remember that scripture? Be of good cheer. Jesus said, I have overcome the world. So he's saying, I've overcome the one that's in the world. I've overcome the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, right up there a little above where we are. I've overcome him. He said, I've come to destroy the works of the devil. Praise the Lord. So all these things he's did, but many times the church will quote, you know, <laughs> they'll say, Carrie, you know, and I'm not negating that things come. Are we here? We're living in the earth, and, and especially if you're going to take a stance for Jesus, and, and then especially from the religious leaders, if you're going to take a stance for the things of the Spirit, they're going to come against us. But they're light. It calls them light afflictions. Amen. But the, the religious leaders or, or, or religious people will look at Kerry. If, he, if, something, if he's having to deal with something for a little bit, they'll look at him or whoever. I just use people. Just understand that doesn't mean Kerry. <laughs> you know what I mean. I'm using examples. But they come at you and they say, well, you know what the word says, Jason. In this world, you're going to have trials and tribulations. And, and, and you just run your survey. 85 to 90 percent of them will turn around and leave you right there. I had people do it to me. They said, Lathan, you know, in this life you're going to have trials and you're going to have tribulations. And they turn around and walk off. You know, and they may say something pretty like, I'll pray for you. Right? Sending good vibes your way. Happy thoughts. All these, all these Christian <laughs> cliches that we throw out. I'm not, you know, I'm not totally against, against them to some degree, but I don't need your thoughts. I need your help. I need the affection for every prayer of the righteous that makes power available. I don't need you to tell me you're going to pray on Facebook. I need you to show up and put hands on me and pray. <laughs> 
this is who we are. This is the place we hold. This is the authority we have. I'm telling you, we should be more focused on the latter part of that verse. It says, be of good cheer for I have overcome. What's he saying? I've overcome the tribulation. I've overcome the trial. I've overcome that whole system. That tells me that I should not live in trials, tribulations in that system. That means they're coming. But hey, I'm focused on the latter part that he overcome them. If he's an overcomer, I'm an overcomer. That's why Pastor Bill said we can't go under for going over. Remember, he'd say that to us. You've got to get your mindset. And here comes the enemy in this soulless realm. We are a spirit that possesses a soul that lives in a body. What's your soul? Your mind, your will, your emotions, your intellect. And, and you don't have to live very long to find out where does the enemy work. He works in your mind, he works in your emotions, and he works on your intellect, right? Right? Come on, are we here? That's where he's, that's his playground, so to speak. Amen. So, this is what I've seen this week in my endeavors to live in the earth. (laughs) And my meditation and prayer time. He's in overdrive with fear. Because fear is an emotion, or tied to the emotions and the thoughts. He's in overdrive with confusion. In the thoughts and the emotions, he's pushing as hard as he can push on humanity to keep them in a state of obsession with problems, obsession with afflictions. I mean, because we go through the word and we get so focused on the trial and the tribulation that we forget there's, he's overcome. He's not going to overcome. He has overcome. He's not one day, guys, Jesus is like, I'm going to get it if I play the game. No, he has overcome the world. Amen. So it says here that uh, these light afflictions, and you go on to verse 18, it says, while we look not at the things which are seen, change your way of thinking and understand that uh, I talked to people this week, and there's like, well, one thing's the devil and one thing's not. And we're trying to find out if it's the devil. I say, is it bad? (laughs) Well, we just need to know for sure if it's the devil. I said, is it bad? Is it bringing comfort or discomfort? Is it bringing confusion or or focus? I I can tell you real quick where it's coming from. Amen. I mean, he's got, he's got the body and he's got humanity convinced that, that <laughs> this is the norm, that we can't live in peace, that, you should, that, that we all have our fear and we name it mine and ours. Yours, mine, and ours. Wasn't that a movie? Because I listen to the, the, the lingo of believers and I listen to people and they're like, my diabetes, my arthritis. My fear. Incline your ear. You'll begin to hear it. My this. And we've even said it. My that. My this. My that. Well, when it's mine, what have I done to it? I've claimed it and took ownership of it. When there was no fear, there was no sickness, there was no turmoil, there was nothing until Satan got his dominion in the earth. So we have to change our mindset that I'm looking at things that I cannot see because the things that I cannot see are causing what I'm seeing. Is that too wordy for you? The things, the realm that I can't see is instigating the seen realm. So I was like, is it bad? (laughs) Then it's coming from the kingdom of darkness. Because God didn't put Adam and Eve in the garden and say, here's the deal. There's a little fear. There's a little doubt. There's a little sickness. You'll have to deal with it once a year when the temperature changes. (laughs) And they called me hyper-spiritual at air text when I said, no, I'm not going to get the flu. He had me start working years ago on the flu. Isn't it interesting? 
that a man-made flu virus comes down the pipe years later. I was prepared. Amen? I, I started getting prepared. And why did I get prepared? Because I listened to the Holy Ghost. He said, Lathan, fight against it tooth and toenail. I don't care. He told me headaches and hangnails. He said, don't put up with it. What's that mean, headaches and hangnails? That means the smallest of the things coming against your physical body begin right now saying, no, because I've been redeemed because of the shed blood of Jesus, the stripes that was on his back. I can begin to believe God. I can get into the unseen, and the seen can get affected by the unseen. So this goes both ways, doesn't it? The unseen realm that we can't see, the enemy and all his junk in that unseen realm working all the time to instigate and, and, and try to put in fear. And if he can sit on the throne of the soul long enough, I mean, he gets like a possession hold on people. Amen. You're like, are we believers possessed? I'm not trying to scare you this morning. I'm saying don't put up with it. Change our mindset that we're not focused on the negative. I'm focused on the redeeming factor of the blood. I'm focused on the healing factor of the stripes. I'm focused on the latter part. Yes, there are these things, but he overcame these things. So when I walk with him, I'm going to get into a place of overcoming these things. Amen? I, I want you to get more excited about it than that. <laughs> He said, while we look at the things which are seen, or look not at the things which are seen, in verse 18, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The not seen realm is, is trying and always and is affecting the eternal. Amen. Praise the Lord. Understand, there's light and there's darkness. I said it like this years ago. I said, little kids, understand it. I think that's why at times Jesus said you got to be like a little kid. Because if I ask a little bitty kid, is Superman a good guy or is Superman a bad guy? He's a good guy. Amen? Is, this will go way back for some of you, Bob and different ones. Is He-Man a good guy <laughs> or a bad guy? There's like Skeletor and all his groups, the bad guys, right? Lex Luthor and all his groups, the bad guys. The Joker, I mean, well, these are just little funny things, but they're so, they're so true in the realm of the spirit. God is the good guy. Jesus is the great elder brother. He is our shepherd. Satan and all his third, you understand, it says a third of heaven fell with him, third of the angels went with him. So his third that's here in the atmosphere around us are the bad doing the bad. Well, we're trying to figure out if it's, if it's, if it's from Satan or is, is it bad? <laughs> is it bad? Then it's for, out of his kingdom. Yes, there is direct where an evil spirit sits on a, a circumstance and there's indirect just because there's sin and he's in the earth and that stuff's around. Amen. Jesus dealt with the, the spirit behind things, and sometimes he just said, be whole, didn't he? Sometimes he rebuked the foul spirit or the spirit of infirmity or the oppressive spirit, and sometimes he said, go, show yourself to the priest, you'll be, you'll be made whole, right? But understand, if Jesus stood here this morning, I'm convinced he'd say, all that stuff is coming out of the kingdom of darkness. Amen? We have to understand there's unseen affecting all the time the scene good and bad go with me since we're in corinthians just go ahead and turn to 10 corinthians second corinthians chapter 10 verse 3 says for though we walk in the don't flip too many pages for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Everybody should say amen. <laughs> this isn't a flesh fight, praise God. That means it's an easier fight. Because if you had to do this in and of yourself naturally, you will not win. So though we war after flesh, we do not, or after we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Verse 4 says, for the weapons, I begin to pray this in Wednesday night prayer. 
Amen. Maybe that's why I'm preaching on today, but it just stuck with me after Wednesday night. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or worldly or natural, but mighty, say mighty, through God to the pulling down of strongholds. For the weapons of our, sometimes we fly by these scriptures and we don't catch these little subtle things. For the weapons of our warfare, this would imply that Jesus has, he's sitting. Remember last week, now we're here fighting the good fight of faith. Amen. The weapons of our warfare are not natural or worldly or of this earth. They're not guns. They're not swords. They're not, they're not all that stuff. But it says they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Verse 5 says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Verse 5, casting down. Anybody heard this scripture before? We've heard this scripture, haven't we? Anybody ever did this scripture before? <laughs> Hallelujah, we can do this. Casting down, casting down imaginations, every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Listen to this. Right before that, what's he tell us? That the weapons of our warfare are not what? They're not carnal, which carnal means worldly or natural weapons. Amen. It says these weapons that we have, they're not of this world, but they're mighty weapons. Amen. We got mighty weapons. And then he goes into this scripture here right behind that and starts telling you to take every thought captive and cast down vain imaginations. So in our lightning fast mind, we begin to understand that imaginations, vain imaginations, not imaginations, let me get it right, vain imaginations, and any thought that tries to excel itself against the knowledge of God, it says to take them in subjection, take them captive, cast them down. So it tells me that these things, if they're not taken hold of, if they're not controlled, causes strongholds. Can you see that? We've quoted that scripture, haven't we? Oh, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. I'm going to pull some strongholds down today. Well, praise God. I hope you do. But understand right behind that, he said, you take your thoughts captive. You take any thought that tries to, tries to be contrary to the God thoughts and the word of God, and you cast vain imaginations down. You take them under control because if you don't, they are the ones building strongholds. Amen. We see it in religious circles. We see it in the days of Jesus. The religious people had mindsets about things that built strongholds. I'm talking fortified strongholds. Amen. That it, that, that it takes some pulling down to get them down. So we, we back up and we look at our life and said, I will not think on the negative. What, where's, is Dareth here? What's your scripture, Dareth? Thinking on these things. Yes. Thinking. How do you take thoughts captive? You replace them to begin to think the word of God. The word of God says, I'm thinking on whatsoever's holy, whatsoever's good, whatsoever's pure, whatsoever's powerful, if there's any praise, all that stuff. That he says, think on these things. Right before that, what's he tell us in Philippians 4.19? He says, don't worry, don't take no thought, be careful for nothing. That's to say, don't worry about anything, take no thought, be careful about nothing. And that ain't mean being stupid, but then he goes right behind that. The word of God's amazing, it'll help you out. It's not as hard as we make it sometimes. He said, how do you be careful for nothing? How do you not worry about anything? You begin to think on these things. The, the enemy is trying to train your thinking. What's the word say? Be not ignorant 
of his devices. One of his devices is to get you to focus and think and focus and think. The world's bad, focus and think. My kids this, focus and think. Our churches do it, focus and think. You know, my job, focus and think. And then you can turn your focuser and your thinker off and turn the TV on, which does your focusing and your thinking for you, right? Do we ever turn on the TV? I'm checking out for a little bit. Turn on the TV, and then it's still plugging in. Fear of this, fear of that. Are you, like I said several weeks, are you a man over the age of 40? Are you a woman doing all, all these things? It's trying to, I, what, I mean, it's all out of the kingdom of darkness. It's a program. We got computer people. It's written code trying to program you to think on these things when God's saying think on these things. And here he's saying that our weapons are mighty, able to pull down strongholds. He's saying take your thoughts captive, because I know that I know un uncontrolled thoughts. And, and thoughts that aren't taken captive and any thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God begins to build strongholds. Can you see that? So the next time you say, hallelujah, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What strongholds are we pulling down? We're pulling down all the mindsets in our life that are contrary, that are against the knowledge of God. All these thoughts that healing was for yesterday and not today. The apostles died and they're dead and gone. No apostles in the earth. No prophets in the land. We don't want a pastor. We want preachers. If he does any pastor, let's vote him out. <laughs> right? I'm just telling it like it is. All these mindsets, we have mighty weapons to pull those down. And we should be doing so. So I asked myself this week, when I hear things, I asked myself, I said, am I, focused on, am I focused on whatsoever things are pure, holy, good, of good report, of power, of praise? Or do I turn on Fox News and I focus on whatsoever things are hard, tough? When I read the Bible, does these light afflictions jump out at me? Or the fact that these afflictions are light, that means I can handle this. When I read the Bible, do I get hung up on the trials and tribulations? Or do I am like, I be of good cheer? He's overcome every trial and every tribulation. Amen? We're training ourselves out of this. Praise God. When I train myself out of, out of set and wandering in fear, I get free. Hallelujah. My wife's almost like, I don't want to compare myself to Brother Hagin. Remember he said when they were going in the house one night, and his wife said, I don't think you'd worry if we were dead. Because Brother Hagin said his biggest temptation was to worry. But he told the Lord, I'll never worry. That means every time worry came, he took it captive. He trained himself to take it captive. And he just went through life not worrying. Not that he didn't have opportunity. Amen. <laughs> And I've endeavored in the last 10 years. I was like, I ain't going to worry about nothing. I found the scripture. That means if he tells me not to worry, that he equips me and gives me the ability not to worry, and I cannot worry. And his wife, you know, as they were taking kids in, she said, I don't think you'd worry if we were dead. He said, well, why would I worry then? You're dead. <laughs> I'm sure that went over like a bag of sand, you know, heavy. But I'm not worried. Amen? I'm not worried. I'm looking at things positive. I think we're getting ready to go through the best years the church have ever seen. Hallelujah. I'm talking about the church, the one that the gates of hell won't prevail against. I'm going to be part of it. I'm going to be in it. Amen? Does that mean I haven't had opportunity to worry? I mean, I sold my house. I'm changing jobs. I'm buying this. I'm doing that, and I'm like, all of a sudden, you think, I sit down, I sit down, and, and I get a little bit, maybe just a small inkling of a focus on those things, and all of a sudden, you're like, oh, you know, that worry that makes you want to take a deep breath, or that trying to come on you, and I catch it, and I was like, no, I don't care if, 
if I have to move out of my house and live in a camper or a van down by the river, as old what's-his-name <laughs> would say, that's just fine by me. Hallelujah. I'm fine because I'm in his hands. I'm trusting him with life. And he gets me. I, that's my confession. I don't know where it come from, but it came to me when I first started coming here. I'm going to end up in the right place at the right time with the right people doing the right thing. Amen. And you know how my life has been? Right place, right time, right people doing the right thing. Amen. He takes me from glory. This is why I say these scriptures every week, because I want to train you out of focusing on the affliction, focusing on the tribulation, because he said it's light and it's easy and it's gone. I've dealt with it, and you can walk right through it. Hallelujah. And get the mindset, I'm going from glory to glory. I'm going from strength to strength. I'm going from faith to faith. I'm not moving from failure to failure. He calls me to triumph. I'm more than a conqueror in him. I'm a joint heir with Jesus. Hallelujah. He said that I can know the hope of his calling, the greatness, hallelujah, of the inheritance I have in the saints. Glory to God. He said he'd fill my mouth with laughter, my feet with dancing, my tongue with singing. I'm a laughing, singing, just something waiting to go, prosper, and make it. Hallelujah, take a breath, Layton. I'm just going somewhere to make it. Amen. This is how we have to begin to think. This is what he wants you. This is what he asked you to think on. He said, this day in that old covenant, he said, I've placed two things before you. Life and death. Blessings and cursings. And Pastor Billy said, then he gave you the answer. Choose life. Amen. Choose life. Don't you love it when you got the answer? I always tell my story about Miss Georgie Bora. A few people remember she, she tutored me in grade school because they said, if you don't get that kid tutored, he can't go on to the next grade. <laughs> Amen. But she tutored me. And my mom still this day is like, oh, she helped you so much. And she probably did. But she'd give me these old worksheets and some strange drink. I've never had that drink since. I don't know what it was. <laughs> it was pretty good. It was different. <laughs> had orange pills or something actually sliced in it. And one day I tried to eat one of them because I thought, well, you eat what's in your, it's supposed to be at, you know. And I was eating that orange. I was like looking for a place to spit it. And she goes, did you eat the orange pill? You're not supposed to eat the orange peel. I said, you're not supposed to put it in the drink. That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> but she'd give me my worksheet, you know, and she's like, okay, you got 10 minutes. I'm going to the other room. We've studied this. We went over it. She'd give me my worksheet. And she was elderly. I don't know if she couldn't see it. But I could see where she had copied off these worksheets for me. And I don't know if she tried to white out the answer. But every blank, I could faintly see the answer. And my mom's like, she says, you're just doing so good. <laughs> yes, I am. You want to know how smart I am? I didn't get them all right. I ain't no dummy. Because if she would have, if Miss Georgie Bora would have told mom, said that kid hadn't missed a question in three weeks, my mom would have been like, something's wrong. <laughs> I did real good to keep it in the high B status. <laughs> but this is how we should function, right, as the church. People should walk up and say, you're doing so good, because he gave me the answers. He gave me the answer. Amen. He gave me the answer. Choose the right answer. Is it good or is it bad? Is it the devil? Is it bad? It's the devil. It's out of his kingdom. Amen. Every good. Can you quote it? And perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights, who there's no variableness or shadow of turning. Every good and perfect gift. Hallelujah. Does anybody know what that drink was? It, was? it wasn't orange juice. It wasn't tang. It was reddish, clear, translucent. You could see through it with orange peels floating around in it. We'll just call it Miss Georgie Bora's smart juice, because I was, 
Because <laughs> I was doing good. I was doing good because I had the answers. God gave us the answers so that we could do good. Amen. And the twisted way of thinking that the devil wants to insert is focus on the bad. He even gets you in your Bible time. Like I said, he gets you, and maybe some of you have found yourself there. When I read that these afflictions are light, we're all like, oh, there's that word afflictions. I mean, when I start preaching to somebody out here or ministering to somebody about healing, you know one of the number one scriptures they run to? I'm talking about believers. I'm talking about believers, and I'm saying it's not just once, dozens and dozens of times. I'm like, I believe he's no respecter of persons. I believe if he healed me, then he'll heal you. Hallelujah. I'm not saying it's going to look exactly like, but begin to quote scriptures, by his stripes we were healed. Hallelujah. In the old covenant, he said you're going to be. In this new covenant, he said you were healed, past tense. Said that he came to give us life. I begin to minister all that stuff to people, and they immediately want to go to, well, you know, the apostle Paul prayed, and he said three times. Have you been there? Three times I sought the Lord, and he said, my grace is sufficient for you because Satan sent a, a, a spirit to buffet him. Amen. Like I said, I wish people could get out of our English language and begin to understand all that buffeting spirit and that stuff. When you break that down into Greek, it would imply that he never was dealing with sickness. He was dealing with persecutions and tribulations, an evil spirit that would not quit yelling and screaming and, and coming through a person talking to him and trying to make his path hard. And he said, Lord, take care of this joker, you know. And he said, I did it three times. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for thee. And I always say, what about the grace? We focus on, well, he didn't get his answer. No, he did get his answer. He said, my grace will heal you. My grace will keep you. My grace will keep you from, will get you past this, this short light affliction season of time. And he would imply later in life that that wasn't there. If you read the writings of Paul. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Stand up with me. Praise God. Has it been okay? I wish, I guess I shouldn't say I wish, but one day someone's going to train me how to stay on what I write down. No, I'm going with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Ashley, come play. I think we may do something come up in my spirit during worship. I want to make sure it's right. I think to myself, well, if in my, in my short circle that I run with, and the few believers, used to I was around lots of believers and lots of people at Air Tech, you know, we was around all kinds of just, you know, when you got three or four hundred people working in a factory, you're in a department with, you know, 50 or 60, you're just around people all the time. Now my circles are a little bit smaller, but... And even in my small circles, and two of the people I run with are here today, so I'm not saying it's you guys, but even in my small circles, I hear that lingo. I go to, I go to the Mexican restaurant, and I hear people talking that way, and I go here, and I talk to other believers. And, of course, I'm a pastor, so people call me, and you talk to people, you know, from other churches that want to ask you questions, and, and they, they gravitate towards the afflictions. They gravitate towards the... The focusing on the fear and, 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 and that stuff, they gravitate towards the trials and the tribulations. And I always urge them, I was like, focus on, yes, those things are real. He acknowledges them, but he's telling us to think on good things. He's telling us, he always, he never leads us somewhere and leaves us high and dry. That's not how Jesus works. He never asked his followers to do something that he didn't make a way by which they could go do it. Amen. It's, it's, it's the training, the washing of the word, the renewing of the mind, but it's a mindset that has to be broken. And we know that like Job feared, and that which he feared 
come upon him. Because if you truly allow fear, if you truly allow things like doubt and, and anxiety and all those things to reside and remain and you don't put up the fight of faith against them, then all of a sudden you begin to say those. And I heard in prayer this week that Satan's not a mind reader, he's a lip reader. I was praying and I, I, I'd never, and I was like, Lord, I need some biblical precedence for that. And here I am saying it, and I didn't necessarily find it verbatim, but in my prayer time, in my spirit, I heard that he, once, you're, once you entertain fear long enough, and the thought, what, what happens when you think on something long enough? You say it. And once you've said it, you put it out there, and he's a lip reader. And how did that which Job feared the most come upon him? He began to tell, and he began to speak, and he began to say exactly what he was afraid of. Amen. I'm not telling us to be ignorant. If we're dealing with things, let's get together and deal with them. Amen. Praise the Lord. 